All right, hey y'all, I'm Eve. And I'm Patrick. And this is Take One Broadcast Solutions. We're gonna cover a couple different topics today. We've got some updates in the news. We've got a couple of workflow things that we wanna discuss. And uh, kind of the big one I wanted to start off with is the iPhone. So the iPhone is- It says a lot, cause you're a- Oh, I'm Android all the way. <laughs> But the iPhone is increasingly becoming, you know, kind of a standard bit of gear yeah. in the industry. And we're starting to see a lot of professional workflows that are incorporating the iPhone into the system. I think the most notable and, and newest addition has been the uh, ProRes RAW support for iPhones in what, the Blackmagic camera app, as well as in uh, DaVinci Resolve. It's funny because when Blackmagic has started making the shift to more of a cinematic workflow, it was kind of like, hey, what are they gonna do? Then they came out with DaVinci Resolve, which is free. And I'm a Premiere guy through and through, but having a free piece of software that does the same, if not better, than some of the paid software out there. Well, and as a filthy Linux user, it's really my best option for video editing, period. Right. But now that it incorporates something that's already well known, Apple ProRes, which is arguably the one of the best raw formats out there because it's smaller, it's more lightweight. You can do more with it without having, you know, taxing on your CPU and your hardware. And so with Blackmagic now supporting this Apple ProRes RAW and not just their in their app, but also in hardware solutions, I feel like takes Blackmagic to a new level, which says a lot for Blackmagic and what they're historically known, you know, for, or their lack of. Yeah, and, and, and there were a lot of there are a lot of professionals out there using it. We're seeing more and more news contribution being used uh, with iPhones. There's more YouTubers using iPhones for you know gathering and, and uh, content and B-roll. Um, but the other thing that, that Blackmagic has is the, the camera Pro Dock. Yeah, you know, I'm kind of I know anti it a little bit, but you know, I'm an SDI guy through and through. And the fact that it doesn't have SDI support, but I see what they're trying to do in, in with this camera Pro, Pro Dock now they're saying it's for the live events and multi-camera shoots and that's cool because they've added the ability to gen lock with the end time code mm -hmm. they've also given the ability for remote control over their black magic app which we're actually using portion of that app now to film some of this um, and so to have some of that control functionality that you normally see in studio environments i think says a lot and starts to get some of that old broadcast mentality now into more of a hybrid setup I do hate calling everything pro, especially when it doesn't include SDI. I'm with you. I'm an old school guy. I love, uh, I love the ability to just have a cable, plug it in. I like patch bays. It's easy to troubleshoot. SDI is so reliable. It's so robust. It's such a great transport protocol. Uh, I'd rather use that than HDMI, DisplayPort. You know, any of the kind of prosumer consumer uh, things. Uh, and 2110 has its place and it's certainly, you know, it's growing. Um, but I think calling it the pro dock and not having SDI, it limits its pro capabilities a little bit, but I'm still very interested to see where they go with this and maybe they'll add SDI. So on that kind of subject of the difference between pro and prosumer, uh, so Panasonic has put out some new stuff. So I think the neat thing they're doing is they're trying to bring more of the cinematic options to broadcast. Uh, so they've got the new AKU BX 100 multipurpose 4K camera. Mm -hmm. So this has the three quarter inch MOS sensor, 19 megapixel, the three two bayonet mount. It's got some advanced autofocus according to them. I haven't played with that yet, so I don't want to pass any judgment. And it's interesting because it's software based. Mm -hmm. So that's something that I've seen here recently with Panasonic with the UCX 100 and the PLV 100. UCX 100 was their new flagship um, studio camera, which replaced sort of replaced the UC4000, which we all, you know, grow to know and love, especially in the live events and studio applications. And then the PLB100 was their 35 Super in the same broadcast form factor with 2110 support and Sydney. So with them keeping kind of that ecosystem now with yeah. software updates to give you some functionality, to me, and this is a whole topic for another day, is <laughs> software updates, is that the new future? It is. Especially with AI coming out and saying, hey, we're just gonna add a software update. But that's obviously a conversation for another day. What gets me excited about this UBX, um, and it's funny because it comes recently with a demo we just did for university and the, you know, the growing need for um, good looking, not POV style, you know, wide angle, POV style above the rim camera shots. Yes. Especially something that's robotic that can be controlled remotely. And weight limitations. And weight. And with, with this, 
uh, UBX, it weighs less than five pounds. Yeah, I mean, it's a good, it's, it's going to be an interesting studio camera for sure. And just the, the flexibility that comes with that uh, and the ability to mount it places. It'll be a nice addition to the people who are limited with like a PTZ mm -hmm. currently and are looking for more control, more flexibility than they might get just out of a single PTZ. My curiosity though, because Panasonic is not known for sports. Uh, they're just, that's, their use cases have always been in the sporting environment. And some of that has to do with their sensor, with the, the MOS sensor, different style sensor than like Sony's three chip, um, global shutter versus rolling shutter. And so it's interesting to see that come out with this box camera, mm -hmm. that they're sort of pseudo ta tailoring to the sports environment. Yep because it's not a market that they're historically driven hard in. So I'm curious to see if we're gonna start seeing a shift um, as some other can, camera manufacturers start going out. There's some others that we don't really hear much about anymore. Um, obviously Sony and Panasonic are, are, are big ones, um, Hitachi and Ikigami, but I bet it's almost like Panasonic is wanting to really dive deeper into the sports market. Um, so it'd be interesting to see, because like I said, sensor technology is totally different mm -hmm. than Sony. Um, a three chip CMOS handles better in low light and in slow motion applications, whereas the boss, even though it's more advanced, historically has not been that. Um, so I'd be interested to see with the ZBX. We haven't played with one yet. Maybe reach out to try and get one to see if we can demo it. Do you hear that Panasonic? <laughs> We'd love to get our hands on it and really do a full demo. Maybe you could even be in one of these videos directly. Yeah, but that segues, segues us into another Panasonic product. Yes. The Luminix. Right. Which, this one blows me away. I, I'm excited. I mean, it's, it's a boring topic and it's one I want to do a deep dive into at some point, but just the, the power of LUTs, mm -hmm. the power of being able to predetermine, transfer, move from basically one color space to another. With the right lighting, it's really going to open up a lot of creativity mm -hmm. for a lot of people there. And you know where we're starting to see, and essentially what we're, we're going to look at is, um, without diving too much, past this is, is Lumix has released, Panasonic is releasing the ability to do what they call magic LUT support, which is applying real-time LUTs all via their app, which is actually pretty stinking cool, especially depending on the environment that you're in. And where I see this actually being used a lot is what they're calling the Magdalene effect. You're seeing this a lot in, in um, the NFL and in basketball where they've got a DSL full-frame camera out on a gimbal and they're flying through the crowd. You and I will see the difference. Obviously, there's a difference between a, a you know a studio camera versus a full frame with a LUT applied. Mm -hmm. But I'm all, it's creative options. It is, and that's ultimately I think what what excites me the most is always the different creative options that are available and how we can integrate those, find new workflows, find new ways of doing things. And again, this goes back to even the black magic discussion, the democratization of the technology and having access to that at, at every level. The cinematic look is something that everybody wants mm -hmm. and they're not always sure how to get it. And a lot of times they get really caught up in the camera bodies and you know the, the workflow aspects and they forget that it really has more to do with the shot, the composition, yeah. the lighting, because the types of lenses. Some would argue and I'm probably, you know, I'm not a sports guy myself. Wait, you're a kind of sports. Yeah, this is, a, this is good, gonna be a deep dive at a later point, but go ahead. But, but the, the most football games, basketball games, most of their probably revenue comes from broadcast television. Yeah. Um, and so I almost, you know, my, my question was open-ended almost to myself to answer it myself going, yeah, I think this is the change. I think in order to continue to engage the audience, the viewers, to get people excited about the game is to bring them into it and kind of giving them that movie feel. Mm -hmm. We know we love movies. We love to sit there, especially when it pulls you in. I think that's kind of the direction that sports as a whole, like you said. But Iron Man, not necessarily Avengers Endgame. Yeah, we don't need any snapping happen. We don't need players disappearing from the court. Um, now, it would be cool I'm to see a bit of... Well, there's more than anything. Oh, okay. I was going to say... One was shot on film. The other was completely uh, RE Digital. And there's a marked difference in the color grading between those generations. See, we just went from geek to, like, super geek. This is what just happened. I know. But it happens. You know, if we're going to be super geek, we would be remiss to not talk about Cindy. Not just a standard... It is not just a standard. But it is creating a standard yes. for what I think is changing the landscape of everything. It's funny because I'm wearing no no sponsorship. It's just what I wore. I like the shirt, but NVIDIA, you know, they just had their, their GTC and DC talking about 
what we're about to approach, what Cinti just explored, one of many topics. Are we gonna say the two letters? I think we have to. I hate them, but I like them. I mean, it, ladies and gentlemen, artificial intelligence. So Cynthia is working to kind of standardize the expectations of, of what that's gonna be. We understand it's not an experiment anymore. I mean, lots of us experiment, lots of us are running LLMs at home. Uh, uh, realistically, long-term, AI is here to stay. We're seeing AI being applied to lighting. We're seeing AI being applied to camera shots. We're seeing AI applied to editing. We're seeing AI in script writing. You know, it's absolutely everywhere in live production, in television production, in, uh, you know, worship productions. Uh, I can't think of a place where people are not at least on the periphery using some type of AI. Well, I think, I think a key takeaway, and this is, came from the... Um the, the SIMT Media Technology Summit that just happened, MTS that just happened in October, part of the things that they talked about was IP workflows, mm -hmm. which we, we know well and, you know, well and good, especially from 2110 projects that we've done. Um, live production innovations, again, a lot of what's really driving a lot of this conversation. Um, but also AI integration. I, I, I think AI is not experimental anymore. No. I think there's still a sandbox that people were actively working in. But I think it's actively adopted to our workflows, and it's something that it's shaping how manufacturers even design and R and D their products. Yes, knowing that this AI is here; it's here to stay. Do you feel like our traditional broadcast manufacturers pivoting fast enough? I feel like there's a lot of talk, and there's not really a lot of AI hardware solutions out there yet. I don't feel like I'll say yes and no in for for two reasons. And again, this kind of goes back to. It's the buzzword, it's the hot thing. There are lots of people that want to jump into AI and they want to do it, you know, they want to do the whole move fast break things. And what I think there isn't enough of is measured thought about how that AI really is best used to broadcast. So you have a lot of producers and managers and uh, product managers and things like that who are want to include AI on the tag. They want to, you know, right under 4K, they want to put, you know, AI, HDR. We got too much crap coming out. There's too much garbage in some of that stuff. And what I'm seeing is just the manufacturers who are taking the time to really think about how does AI benefit this workflow right. and how can I do it right? Those are the ones who are going to see more traction and they're going to actually they're going to get value out of their AI right. branding. Well, I think, I think AI adoption is reshaping the professional landscape. I think it's, it is driving a lot of R&D mm -hmm. for manufacturers, not just from a hardware standpoint, but from software. I mean, we've, we've installed a ton of hardware solution, mm -hmm. AI feature sets that have features like tracking and um, even prompting and real-time um, especially in news world, a, a real time, you know, voice and video manipulation for, you know, sensitive topics. So I think it is, it is drastically changing the landscape that we, we know and, and love. I think it's here to stay. It's like MTV finally dying off. I think music, you know, yeah. is, is changed is, is AI. And I think it is a necessary component. Um, are, are really a necessary component for us to stay competitive. And it's, it's gonna be interested, interesting to see how integrators like ourselves can continue to leverage this and, um, and help our clients navigate the waters of what, yeah, everything we've talked about. And, and I, don't, I think for those of you who are getting into the industry, those of you who are, are kind of starting out your journeys in, in production, I wouldn't worry that AI is going to replace you. Automation, has, it, automation is going to always create efficiencies and AI can accelerate some of that automation because it provides a little bit of additional thinking for the computer. But realistically, what you're gonna see is as new workflows are created, as new companies you know, start up and people really utilize it, they're not gonna hire you to do something that could have been automated or, or that was automated or, or AI-ified in the past. They're gonna hire you to do something different and they're gonna hire you to do something new and, and you'll just use those tools as part of your workflow and part of what you do. Yep. So don't lose heart. AI is coming for us all, but not right away. And it's not going to necessarily take every job. It's gonna free up people to do other ones. We don't have to worry about the three laws of robotics yet. 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 Out of everything we've talked about, what's the most exciting for you? I'm not gonna lie. It's it's got to be the ProRes support, the, the raw support. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the the ability to have raw 
you know, raw ProRes where I can apply my own LUTs, I can do my own color grading, uh, I can do my own color matching. I think that that is going to open up so many great options to the high school student that wants to make a video project and wants it to look good. Right. And ultimately, I think that's a really good thing. You know, when I was in high school, we were still shooting everything on tape and we were still editing, you know, tape to tape. We had real generational quality loss between every edit. I thought it was stone tablet, but that's okay. Thankfully, my dad was the stone tablet guy and I got to upgrade, but I, I really wish, well, I don't wish. I'm glad I had the experiences I had and they got me where I am, but I'm also glad that my kids are going to grow up with access to this technology and they're going to be able to imagine something in their head and see that in their production uh, much easier right? And, and much more cost effectively. You know, that accessibility is going to be huge. What about you? What do, what do you think out of all this is kind of the, the biggest news for you? Surprisingly, it's, um, it's the whole AI adoption. Now, I'm young enough that I've seen the mass change from analog to digital, digital, well, HD, HD to 4K. I've even remember in 2006 when YouTube was blocked at my high school mm. because it just started to come out. So I'm in that weird, and, and you as well, I feel like anyone alive in this generation today is seeing a radical change mm. in technology across the board. It's exciting for me because it gets me excited for what's to come for my own kids yep. and seeing what, what will come help them in their future endeavors. I know for AI, it helps me drastically in a lot of what I do and just helping think through correct slots. And not just because I'm trying to be lazy, no. but it's, it's tools, it's things. I mean, I'm not, I'm, not a, I'm not a programmer. Right. And with AI, I can tinker. And these aren't, I'm not producing things. These aren't products. This is just me wanting to take a microcontroller and do something neat with it. Right. That was really hard just five years ago. Well, I'm not going guesstimate, to guesstimate the measurement of something when I've got the tool of a ruler in front of me. Does it make me lazy? No, it's, it's using the resources and the tools that I've been given to make myself a better professional in my career, a better person in, in my life in general. So yeah, AI to me is, is interesting. It is just to see the adaption across what we do again as integrators and what others are doing as far as your manufacturers are concerned. Yeah, it's exciting. I it think is. it's exciting times. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for hanging out with us. Uh, there's going to be more of these. We're going to be trying to make this a regular segment where we go over the various different products coming out, some of the changes and trends in the industry. Uh, Patrick and I are probably going to do some deep dives on various different subjects like I, I hinted at. I've been really looking forward to having a discussion about HDR in workflows. Um, I know we want to have a, dis a deep dive discussion on cinematic looks, particularly in worship productions, because that's been a really hot topic recently. Uh, we do also want to spend some time talking about sports all the way from the high school, you know, uh, level all the way up to the professional and kind of talking about some of the different things that are possible there. Uh, please give us a like, give us a subscribe, uh, give us a call if you like anything we're talking about. If you want to talk to us about your particular uh, situation, what you're trying to solve, uh, we love fixing problems. You know, that's solving things with solutions, thinking it through your know, work production people. Uh, this is fun for us. If you want to reach out to us, give us a call at one eight seven seven eight one take one or drop us an email at mail at take one dot TV. And uh, we'll hopefully talk to you again soon. Been a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Thank you.